Um, and in this particular case, Hayom is meant quite literally. Yes, as Alyssa can attest, I spent the last two or three weeks agonizing over the timing of the release of my book in time for this evening. I have several, a couple other book launches, but they're next week. And I was desperate to have books available here tonight when I'm giving so my opening book launch of, among friends here in Efrat. Uh, of course, most of you I know personally. And, and so today, literally today, Hayom, um, I picked up the books that we have here, um, and you will all are welcome to purchase at a discounted rate. Um, we'll talk about that later. Um, but I just want to express gratitude for the opportunity to come fully equipped to my first book launch here in the front. Okay. I want to. I also want to express gratitude to a few. To a, I started this project about four years ago. Um, and I had a group of students, I call them Talmidim, Talmidim Chaverim, students who were peers, essentially, um, and who uh, I invited to come along to work through some under text analysis of Sefer Breshit, and, and that was the beginning of the process, and they played a critical role in my ability to, to sort of formulate my ideas, um, get feedback, Nathan, um, who else from that group is here? A bunch of other people who were part of that group. And uh, it's one of them, maybe others will come as well. And I'm honored that people who had an instrumental role in this book here. And then, just this past year, I had the opportunity to teach literally the book in the Women's Baby Drush at the front. And a couple of my students, Tanya Bracha, are here. Jessica. Jessica, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, my students are here, uh, some of them, and it's a great honor that you are here. I've spoke a lot about the book over the course of the year. And um, you, you also forced me, in a very positive way, to make some last minute changes to the manuscript because your comments were just so wonderful. And, and I had no choice but to go back and make corrections. Um, thank you. Um, finally, I want to express gratitude to the host and hostess, uh, David and Sarah, who host this evening. Now, this is, you know, Kvot Achsanya. Um, usually refers to a physical space, which this is a wonderful, beautiful space with a beautiful view. Um, but the Achsanya in this particular case with Sarah and David is far more than a physical space. Um, Sarah and I have become, as she mentioned, colleagues, not just because we teach together, but we've had many, many opportunities to talk Torah and to share ideas out of the box, ways of reading text. And there's one thing that Sarah and I have in common and our passion for learning, our passion for not subscribing or not conforming to the standard ways of reading texts. Uh, and we've got, we have both established a reputation at, at TVA, the Naked Program We Teach, for being a little bit pushing the boundaries. Um, and I, I think we both do it with, with great pride that we push the boundaries to the extent that we can. Um, and I also want to say something about David. David, who's a lawyer, businessman, uh, but what people don't know, because he's very quiet and unassuming, is that he's a tremendous Bible scholar. And, uh, and if you have a chance before you walk out of this house to look at this unbelievable library that I imagine Sarah had, but I, I think that David had a significant role in putting this incredible library together. It is an amazing collection, and I've often referred to it. So, so my gratitude towards Sarah and David, not just for providing a space, but providing like, like an opportunity, like friendship on a deeper level, on a like deep understanding, sharing ideas, um, and ways to present sometimes radical ideas. And so thank you so much for hosting this on multiple levels. OK. All right. Now, I know that we have time restraints. Why? Because it's already 8.15. People don't want to spend too much time <coughs> learning new ideas. Nevertheless, I'm going to try to share with you some of the, the key concepts that I've developed. And the challenge really is for pretty much everyone in this room, I say pretty much, but I probably could say everyone in this room, has studied the early chapters of Zephyr Breshit, Parshiot, Breshit, and Noah, not once, not twice, but multiple times. We read the parsha, so whatever number of years you're alive, that's how many times you've studied on some <laughs> levels, parsha, parashita, noah. 
And I'm sure you've had occasion to study these partial in different contexts as well, in school, in seminary, in university, whatever it is. And so the challenge is really enormous because I, I'm trying to claim that I have a dramatic new approach to chapters, to stories and chapters that you are, with which we are all familiar. And so I have, I'm giving myself, and if David and Sarah have the way, it will be far less time than I'm actually allowing myself, but it's going to be less than an hour. I'm trying to, going to try to convince you that I have something dramatically new to say about the early chapters of Sefer Brish. Okay, so I asked you to bring. Okay, I asked you to bring. I asked you to bring Sefer Brishit because we're going to do very briefly. We're all asking Sefer Brishit, so you're going to get a little lost at some point if you don't have the text with you. Helen. Okay. So. Are we, oh, you also have your phone. That's a good point. You can use your phone. Where's your phone? Okay. Now, are we ready to begin? My my time. The stopper is be, is is starting at this moment. Yes. No. I'll leave until everybody has a kumash in their hand. Anyone else need? Yeah. Excellent. That's the back. Okay. So, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna throw out a concept which I'm sure many of the learned people in this crowd know immediately. And we're going to work through this briefly together. If I say the words, the magic words, creation one, creation two, help me out here. What am I talking about? Please. Oh, Feel free. Parak Aleph and Parak Bet. and Parak Bet and Parak Bet which continue, which tell different stories. Of they presume different stories. Okay, for those who aren't familiar, we're going to just touch upon or summarize some of the key differences. We have two stories of creation which are very, very different. Can anyone enumerate or list some of the key differences between the story of creation in Parashit Barak Aleph and the story of creation that begins in Parak Bet Pasuk Dalit? Who can, briefly, what are some of the key differences between these two stories? Three, yes. The order of when things have been created? Yes, so specifically, what, what, where, is the con where is there a contradiction, so to speak? Um, between plant life versus man versus animals. So go ahead, right. In, so in Parak Aleph, it's plants, then animals, then man? Correct. And in Perakbet, it's um, first man, Correct. plants, then animals. Correct. Okay, so the order is completely different. In Perakshi Perak Aleph, we learn about, first we hear about right, the creation of plants, trees, and then we hear about animals, right, day three, day, uh, and day five, and, and, and part of day six, and the animals, and subsequently, end of day six, we have the creation of the human being. In Perakbet, you have the human being first, and then God creates plants and trees, right, min ha'adama, Right after the human being is already in existence. Okay, next, what are the differences? The name of God. The name of God. So the name of God is in part in Parak Aleph is what? Is no. In Elohim, sorry, Elohim. In Parak Bet, it's Hashem Elohim. You gave up Elohim, and that's consistent. Okay, you have Elohim throughout Parak Aleph until Pasuk Dalid of Parak Bet, and then suddenly it switches to Hashem Elohim. Gave up Elohim. Anything else? Go ahead. Man and woman. Man and woman. Go ahead. Uh, in Parak Aleph, man and woman are created together. And created together. Yeah. They're first man and then woman. First man and then woman. Excellent. What else? How about the nature of the man? No, let's talk about the 40 minutes. How about the function of the animals? What is the function of the animals in Parak Aleph? What is, what is expected of the animals in Parak Aleph? Puravu. Although it doesn't say explicitly with regard to the animals, it says it with the fish, but it's implied that Puravu, that's an animal. That's, what does it say? What's the function of the animals in Parak Bet? Why did God create animals in Parak Bet? For the service of man. Because, because God recognized that human beings were lowly, shockingly, God thought that animals might provide solace and comfort to the man, right? As a response to lo toba yota dam lo something in animals. So it's a completely different order, and it's a different function. The animals in Parak Aleph are there for where they have their own distinct function, where in Parak Bet they're created for the purpose of the human being. <coughs> All right, next, what else do we have? Okay, how about the nature of the human being? Who is the human, what defines the nature of the human being in Parak Aleph? What? Selim Elohim. The human being is this godly creature who has whatever Selim Elohim means. He, in, in, inherently, he has this godlike quality within him, right? Which is, in his very essence, he's got Selim Elohim, right? He is a godly creature. Whereas, in Parabet, what are we told about the human being? Afarim Adama. Afarim Adama. 
Oh, it couldn't, couldn't have a greater contrast than that, because in Perak, Aleph, man, is this godly creature, this lofty creature. In Perak, Beck, he's, he's just d dust of the earth. He's dust of the earth. In fact, right, God makes the human being from the Adama, just as he makes, what else? He makes animals from the Adama. He makes trees from the Adama. He creates a human being from the Adama. So the human being is no better than the animal in terms of his, his inherent worth, because he's just a farmer. So what makes the human being special? By virtue of what is a human being distinct from other creatures, according to Perak Bet? That God personally blew his breath into the human being and gave him life. In other words, it's not that the human being inherently has some godlike quality in Perak Bet. He's nothing more than a father in Adana in his essence. But God blew in the breath, breath of life. And so, by, by virtue of that, human being became significant, became important. God showed his caring and concern by virtue of having a hands-on personal involvement in providing life to the human, that lowly human being, okay? What about, what about the nature of God? What do we get, what's the nature of, besides we talk the names of God, what is the nature of God in Paragraph Aleph? What kind of a God do we hear about in the creation story of Paragraph Aleph? What is, who is he? An organizer? An organizer, for sure. What else, he besides organizer? He's a giver, like manners, meaning, like, he's, He's creating everything. And well, I'm not about giving. He's certainly creating. Sure. Right? But what does it say about what about God's power in Paragal? What about God's sovereignty? He gives brother. True, but even before that, what do we have about God's character? What do we God, if you look at the story, what? Mysteries. He speaks, but he doesn't speak to the human so much, except a little bit. Largely he's speaking sort of in abstract. And then things happen. The speech isn't necessarily only once is directed towards the human. It's largely directed out there. It's like, right? It's it's just a, a voice that utters words, and things happen. But in Perak Aleph, God is this sovereign, transcendent creator of the universe. Right? Everything that exists exists because of God, and He's sort of out there determining how the work the, to give shape to the world, what the world is going to look like. It's a very structured, organized pattern of creation. Everything is makes sense. Right, day one and day two and day, I don't have time to show you this, but day four sort of parallels those is the fulfillment of, of, of day one, day five, day parallels to day two, day six parallels day three, in ways which I don't have time to get into. You'll read the book. You'll read the book. <laughs> um, that'll be my refrain throughout the evening. <laughs> Big surprise. Um, but, but what you get a sense is this God of Perak Aleph is this God who's, who's got it all together, who's got a very, very clear plan. It's like an architect, with the architects in this crowd, I don't know. If there are, you probably know what I'm talking about. Oh, Hadley. So people who know, you, you imagine what you want the, the particular project to look like, and then you sort of imagine in your head, and you write it down, you make a very clear plan, structure, order, purpose, design, and then if you're doing a, a good job, like I'm sure Hadley does, at the end of the day, she looks and says, that was good, that good job, which is exactly what God does. By the way, I think in this particular case, the word vayal, he told, doesn't mean good, it means perfect. Okay, I don't want to get into it, but I believe that the essence of the theme is tov in this case doesn't mean just good, like in a moral sense, because good is sort of, you know, eight in your report card, right, is tov. No, 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 this isn't eight, this is ten. God is saying the world that created is perfect, exactly the way I want it. And then he emphasizes at the end of the sixth day, he made tov me old. God at Perak Bet is totally different, right? First of all, it doesn't talk about God who created the entire universe, it's talking more about a God who, 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 uh, who focuses on man, right? If you have text, you can read this. That he's involved in, in a sort of concern about man. He focuses on, on the human being, right? Vayitzer, which is which is some point of not the word vayivra, which means something different, although it's not clear exactly what. Forming rather than creating, blowing, right? Building, blowing, and it's a very personal kind of involvement. And then when he sees the human being is lowly. He, he, what does he do? He turns things upside down and figures out create new creations so that the human being is no longer lonely. This is a God who's intimately involved in the affairs of the world, not sitting in the lofty, in the heavens above, but he's very much down to earth, related to the human beings here on earth. So we have completely different descriptions of the story of creation. And I would even go further, they are virtually contradictory, right, in many respects, right, whether it has the, the order of animals, and vegetation versus the human being, whether it has to do with the man and the woman, right, being created together versus man being created first. The nature and purpose of it, the nature of the human being. Oh, I forgot to say the purpose of the human being. What is the purpose of the human being? According to Perry Health, what's his function in the world? 
or I should say theirs function of it. Before Kivshuwa, you're right. Before the world of it's about filling the world, propagating the species, filling the world, conquering the world. We're doing right, the famous psukim that you all know. And in Paradent, there's nothing of that. None of that. What is what is oh, the text tell us about? The, well, before we get to Ulf Dal there's a text that says even before, before he goes into Paradent, the text says something else. Right? Even before he goes into Paradent. Right? In other words, it says, it says, the Chotzea Chasadet Terem Yeda Aretz. Right? What do you have here? When no shrub of the field was yet on earth and no grass of the field yet sprouted because the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth and there was no man to till the soil, implying that the function of the man is largely to work the land. That's totally different. Because first of all, the word Eretz and the word Adama, the word Eretz appears in Perak Aleph, the word Adama appears in Perak Bet, and in fact for good reason. Because Adam... Think about the connection, etymological connection. Adam is, his origins are Adama. Not only his origins are Adama, his function is related to the Adama. So here we also have completely different purposes for the human being. In the Perak Aleph, his purpose is Pur, Vumi, Ua, Vachiv, Shua, Wadu, Vigat, Hayam, Uvon, Fashem, Blah, blah, blah. In Perak Bet, you have a human being whose function is, uh, right, is Lavoda Tama, I would even say, Lavoda Tama in his immediate proximity. There's no notion of filling the earth. Lavoda Ta Adama, the Adama is right here, below, beneath my feet. Why God put him in Gaeden? That's chapter two of my book. But, but nevertheless, it, it's completely different. Now, so you have these differences in terms of the nature of the human being, the nature of animals and, and, and trees and vegetation, and the human being, his nature, his purpose, the relationship between the man and the woman, between who is God, what is God, what's fun, how do we understand the nature of God? What do you do? What do you do when you have this long list of contradictions? Right? between two stories that presumably tell the story of creation in radically different ways. What do you do? So here, I want to read Rashi. I want to read Rashi. And Rashi, I'm only going to focus just as an example, I'm going to focus on one, one of the contradictions between the two stories. Now, Rashi was aware of many, not all, but many of the contradictions, as were Chazal. And this is how he addresses the tension or the contra conflict between the version of creation of Perak Aleph and the ver of the man and the woman in Perak Aleph versus Perak Bet. Right? Perak Aleph, it says that man and woman were created together. And Perak Bet says man and woman, when first man, then the woman. So what does Rashi say? How does he address this problem? So he says the following. Perak, uh, Perak Aleph, Pasuk, Kavzai. Zecha unekeva bara utam. Ula halan hu hu omer. Vayikach achat mitzalotav. He's addressing the tension. The text in, in Bereshit Perak Alf says, But in Perak Bet, it says that God created the, human, the woman out of his rib. How do you reconcile this contradiction? So Rashi offers two answers. Very fascinating, given Chazal is based on Chazal, that how do you reconcile these contradictory texts? Perak Aleph is talking about God created a two headed monster, human being. Who has two heads, male and female, sides. right? What? Two sides, the whole body. Okay, okay, two heads. Okay, fine, fine. That's called two sides. And then, paradigm, God splits them. And now we have, right? Now, besides the fact that it sounds completely far fetched, it's also completely contradicted by the text. Because if you look in Perak Vav, in the story of the flood, right, what does it say in the story of the flood? In Perak Vav, Pasu, Tet, and other places as well. Repeatedly, the text refers to the animals that, 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 that um, um, boarded. boarded the ship, the boat, the tiva, and what does it say? Does, does, does Rashi, Chazal, imagine that they're the two headed animal or two halves of an animal? Pshat! Guys, pshat, zachar unekeva means male and female. Okay? And the second, in other words, since you can't say that there, that the animals were sort of two-headed or two sides, right, but rather simply pshuto zechav nekeva, right, it's very, very, very far-fetched to suggest that that's what it means in this case. And the second explanation that Rashi gives is equally problematic. What does he say? So, no, Perak Aleph is teaching the general principle that they were created on the sixth day, and they didn't des describe how they were created on the sixth day, right? And Peripet is coming to, to, to give you further detail about the way that creation unfolded. 
The problem with that is that the two stories contradict each other. Because if you want to say, Perak Aleph says they're created together, and Perak Bet says man was created first, and then the, then the woman, and so to say that the, the Perak Bet is simply an elaboration of Perak Aleph is missing the point, in my opinion. Now, what possessed Rashi? Can I have one point there? Sure. The Pasuk Zachar and Kedal Baratan comes right before Pruver Vu. Okay. The, that continuity seems clear that the function of Zachar and Kedal is to enable all the, all the more so why Zachar and Kedal has to be understood Kipshuto. Because Pu Uvu means, right, reproducing is procreation. How do you procreate? Well, we all know male and female. So to suggest that it's a one, a, a two-sided monster that has, it, it's ridiculous. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm speaking <laughs> condescendingly about Rashi, but in this particular case, I don't think it works. Yes. But just in that same pasuk, it says Otova Otama. Yeah, that's but to, that's that's the exception rather than the rule. But that's not the question Rashi's addressing. That's a question that Chazal addressed elsewhere, but that's not the question Rashi's addressing. Right? Chazal addressed the question: What's the relationship between the word Otova and Atam? Because that, that seems to contradict itself. And there's different answers, but that's not the question Rashi is addressing here. He's addressing the tension between Perak Aleph and Perak Bet. And unfortunately, I don't think his answer is satisfactory. But, but, and here's the but. What possessed Rashi to come up with this approach? By the way, he does this with other contradictions. The, the names of God, well, the, the, uh, the, the vegetation, coming, Perak Aleph coming before the human being, and Perak Bet coming after. Rashi, again, based on Chazal, have his, their own ways, his own way of addressing ad hoc each particular each particular contradiction in its own, right, very specific way. What, what prompted this kind of approach is, I believe, a, a consistent tradition that we've had for hundreds, if not thousands of years, which is dominated parshanut, whether it's, whether it's halachic parshanut or, or narrative parshanut, is that the Torah has to speak in one voice and it cannot contradict itself. And if we assume that is our working assumption, the Torah cannot contradict itself, then what are you going to do when there's a contradiction? So you have to go about what I would call intellectual gymnastics to find creative ways to reconcile contradictions. Because the premise is the Torah can only speak in one voice. And this is my point of departure. Because in the late 1800s and the late 19th, all the way to the late 19th century, there was a school called, it was a, Bible, people who studied the Bible, who later became known as Bible critics, looked at these stories and many, many others. And they said, guys, get a grip. This is not, you can't resolve the contradiction between this, that detail and this data by focusing on specific issues, right? Resolve the contradiction between the man and the woman and the versus perfect bed, et cetera, et cetera. And each one at an ad hoc solution to the problem. What they said is, guys, what you have to see here is a pattern. The pattern is that there are two completely different worldviews. And these completely different worldviews is proof, according to Bible critics, that the Torah is comprised of different authors. That the Torah must have been written by different authors. Because how else do you have two contra completely contradictory stories of creation? The, the solution isn't finding ad hoc right, so, oh, attempts at har harmonizing contradictory texts, but it's recognizing that the, the entire narrative, the thrust of the narrative of Perak Olive is completely different from the thrust of the narrative of Perak Bet. And so therefore, right, any attempts at local or at ad hoc solutions doesn't cut it. What we have to understand is that there are two completely different worldviews. And so the Bible critics came up with what's called the documentary hypothesis, right, in which they, they just determined, based on many, many years of research, mostly textual research, and they concluded largely that there are four sources or authors in the Torah, J, E, P, and D. Now, I don't want to go into all what these letters represent, I'll talk about it in my book, but, but P, for example, is a priestly, priestly, right, the priestly source. Okay. And so, once this theory came about, the hypothesis came about, and became widespread, you had two options. Really, if you were studying Bible, from the late 19th century until the second half of the 20th century, you pretty much had two options. Either continue to follow the path of traditional biblical exegesis, which had been customary for hundreds if not thousands of years, by which, whenever there's a contradiction between two texts, we have to find creative ways to reconcile them so that Torah speaks in one voice, because that's the working premise. Or, the other option is you have to accept biblical criticism, understanding that there are not Right, there isn't one voice, right? In fact, the Torah wasn't written by God at all. It's four different authors. 
J, E, P, and D, those are, I don't want to explain what those letters stand for, written at different times by different authors. And that's why there's so many contradictions and inconsistencies in the Torah. And that's more or less, those are the options you had in front of you if you wanted to study the Tanakh from the late 19th century until the first half of the, sec of the 20th century. Those are pretty much your only options until 1965. What happened in 1965? This article, The Lonely Man of Faith, by Absolvich. How many of you have read this essay at some point? If you haven't, <laughs> what? All of it? <laughs> okay. If you haven't, then it's a must read. Only warning I have for you. If you want it, if you decide to read it, make sure that you decide to read it three or four times, because you will not understand it the first or the second time. However, this work, it's an article, a 60 page article, it was turned into a book, um, was a radical breakthrough in my opinion. It wasn't simply one of the greatest works of Jewish philosophy or Bichlal theology of the 20th century, which I think it was. In my opinion, perhaps the greater contribution of Rav Soloveitchik is his, his attempt at offering a new approach to Parshanut Hamikra, a new approach to biblical exegesis. In what way? Now, I can't possibly do justice to this wonderful work, but I'm going to focus on the one example I just gave. I focused on the contradiction between Perak and Aleph and with regard to the recreation of the woman and the man. Okay? And so, we saw what Rashi has to say. And that was a very standard way of approaching these kinds of texts. Rav in his entire thesis of this article, Splash Book, was that, no. In fact, he lists all or many of the contradictions between Perak, Aleph, and Perak, Bet, fully aware of biblical criticism. He actually acknowledged that the Bible critics decided that therefore there must be different sources. And he said, no, no! The Torah, i.e. God, who wrote the Torah in Rav Soloveitchik's view, taught us about two conceptions of the man, of human being. Dual man, not dual authorship. And so one approach, the Rav says, is has to do with, right, Perak Aleph has, an, it's the majestic man, man of dignity, I, I can't do, I'm not gonna summarize. And Perak Bet is a completely different type of human being, someone who's humble, whose origins are earthly, who, who sees the world very differently rather than trying to dominate and control, right, but in technology, but rather submits and appreciates a whole different. And, and, and so, so rather than come up with ad hoc solutions to tensions between or contradictions between sources, he says, no, these are very real. And let me just read to you the difference, like what he says about this particular question, about the man, the idea of the man and the woman. So, what does he say? Um, again, this is, this is very small excerpts from a work that is a must read. So he calls Perak per Aleph Adam the first. This is chapter, page 13. Adam the first, namely the Adam of Perak Aleph, the first is aggressive, bold, and victory minded. His motto is success, triumph over the cosmic forces. He engages in creative work, creative work trying to imitate his maker. This is his uh, analysis of the, the, the human being that emerges from the, from the story of Perak Aleph. Okay, and what does he do with the human being from, from Peripet? He says, Peripet, on the other hand, is, is offering a different kind of human being. Um, and he says, hold on. Okay, it, oh, it therefore, Adam the first was created not alone, but together with Eve. Male and female emerged simultaneously. Adam the first exists in society, in community with others. In other words, you need to understand there's a connection between the way the human being is described in Perak Aleph, a farmida dama, excuse me, the other way, Selam Elohim, masterful, controlling, majestic, etc., etc., right? And his goal is to further the, the species and, the, and to build and to expand the world, etc. So that's why you have to be created man and one, male and female, emerge simultaneously, Adam the first exists in society, in community with others. So of course he had to be created along with the woman. Okay. On the other hand, the man of Perak Bet, I'm sorry, I'm just kidding. According to the biblical story, God was not concerned with the loneliness of Adam the first. Neither was Adam aware of the pronouncement, it is not good for man to be lonely. In other words, that doesn't make sense in the concept of Perak Moreover, the connotation of these words in the context of the worldview of Adam the first, even if they had been addressed to him, would have been related not to loneliness and existential in-depth experience, but to aloneness in practical surface experience 
Adam I, representing the national community, would translate this pronouncement into pragmatic categories, referring not to existence as such, but to productive work. If pressed for an interpretation of the pronouncements, pronounce that he would paraphrase it, it is not good for man to work alone. No talk asal tadam levado. Okay? The words, I shall make him a helpmate, would refer in accordance with his social philosophy to a functional partner to whom it would be assigned to collaborate with and assist Adam I in his undertakes, undertaking schemes and projects. Eve vis-a-vis -vis Adam I would be a work partner, not an existential co-participant. Okay. In other words, that is what Adam I is according to our salvation. However, right, Peric Bet is a different kind of a human being. And so when he's talking about the woman, the function of the woman, he says, if I found the covenantal faith community of Adam the two, is what he describes. Again, don't ask me some of this terminology, you have to read the article. In contradistinction to the natural work community, i.e. of Peric Aleph, interprets the divine pronouncement, it is not good for man to be alone, not in utilitarian, but in ontological terms. It is not good for man to be lowly, not alone, with emphasis placed upon to be. Being at the level of the faith community does not lend itself to any equation. To be is not to be equated with to work and produce goods, etc., etc. To be is a unique in-depth experience of which only Adam II is aware and it is unrelated to any function or performance. In other words, completely different visions of the relationship between man and the woman because, because they were assigned different roles because, and because Peric Aleph is, is describing one kind of human being and Peric is describing another, and therefore the relationship between men and, men and women are completely different. This companionship which Adam II, namely Adam of Perbeck, is seeking is not to be found in the depersonalized regimentation of the army, in the automatic coordination of the assembly line, or in the activity of the institutionalized, soulless political community. His quest is for a new kind of fellowship, which one finds in the existential community. There, not only hands are joined, but experiences as well. There, one hears not only the rhythmic sound of the production line, but also the rhythmic beats of heart, beat of hearts starved for existential companionship and all-embracing sympathy, and experiencing the grandeur of the faith community. There, one's lonely soul finds another tormented by loneliness and solitude, yet unqualifiedly commit committed. This is greatness. This is poetry and theology in one. But, but what he's doing here is he's saying these are two comp completely different accounts because they are describing two kinds of man, two kinds of human being. Okay. So what do you do with the fact there's two completely different concepts of the human being and two types of relationship between man and the woman? So this is how he ends this, more or less, towards the end. When he's addressing, there's an inherent tension, there's contradiction between the two accounts. So what do you do with this? So he says the following. The biblical dialectic stems from the fact that Adam the first, majestic man of dominion and success, and Adam the second, the lowly man of faith, obedience and defeat, are not two different people locked in an external confrontation as I opposite a thou, but one person who was involved in self-confrontation. I, Adam the first, confronts the I, Adam the second, and every one of us abide two persona, the creative, majestic Adam the first, and the submissive, humble Adam the second. As we portray them typologically, their views are not commensurate. Their methods are different. Their modes of thinking distinct. The categories in which they interpret themselves and their environment incongruous. Yet, no matter how far-reaching the cleavage, each one of us, each each of sorry, each of us must willingly identify himself with the whole of an all-inclusive human personality, charged with the responsibility as both both a majestic and a covenantal being. God created two atoms and sanctioned both. Now, forget philosophy for a second. Just think parshanut. This is unprecedented because what he's doing is acknowledging that there are contradictions in the Torah, blatant contradictions. But he's saying God intended it that way. God is introducing us to complexity, to the dual human being, to types of human, to, to typologies, to types, right? And, and, and that's real. And our job is to live with that contradiction. So rather than what Parshanut, medieval and early Parshanut typically did, was when you have a contradiction, let's find creative ways to reconcile and say it's only one idea. And so Levinshik says, no, there are two distinct competing ideas and they're both true. And they are both part of, part of God's Torah. So to me, this is the greatest breakthrough because it's giving us a third option. Because if traditional exegesis was about reconciling contradictory texts, 
And a biblical criticism was saying contradictory texts must be attributed to different authors. Rav Soloveitchik comes along and says, no to both. We don't need to artificially reconcile contradictory texts, and we don't need to attribute reconcile a contradictory text to different authors. God himself wrote a complex work called the Torah, and inherent with it has contradictions. And we have to embrace both worldviews. Okay. Now, Rav Salvechik actually did embrace biblical criticism. On a certain level, he rejected it. Although, what he did do is accept the holistic approach which biblical criticism brings to the table. Namely, seeing larger themes, seeing worldviews that emerge from varied, various texts in the Torah. This is, like I said, 1965. This, to me, is the greatest contribution of this work besides its great philosophical genius in terms of Parsha. But more or less at the same time, this was in America, 1965, more or less at the same time, a man by the name of Rabbi Mordechai Breuer was the day in Israel. And he went even further than Rav Soloveitchik because he said, if Rav Soloveitchik only wrote this article to address the contradictions between Barak, Perak, Aleph, and Perak, Ben, because Rav Soloveitchik wasn't a biblical exegete, he wasn't interested in, in, in giving an ongoing partial loop of the text, he had something that he wanted to, to write, a message that he wanted to share with the world through his analysis of Pesha, Perak, Aleph, and Perak, Ben. But Mordechai Breuer, again in Israel, saw contradictions everywhere. Not just in Rishi Perdel, because they are everywhere, throughout the Torah, both in narrative and in law. And he was fully aware of biblical criticism. But unlike Rav Soloveitchik, he actually embraced it. Almost completely. And if you, he, when he came up with a, a concept, an approach called Shitata Bechinot, which is translated as the aspects approach. And articles, the articles that he wrote on the subject from the 60s, from 1959 all the way into the 90s, were collected in this book called Shitata Bechinot Shavah Mordechai Boreh. The first half of the book is the collection of articles that he wrote on the subject. And the second half is rabbinic leaders taking issue, either supporting or objecting to his approach. But the first half are actual articles that he wrote on the subject. And I want to read just one paragraph. He summarizes, he summarizes the, the, uh, the, the approach of biblical criticism. And then, and then he has his take on it. I'm glad you're all sitting down, because in a moment, you'll probably be falling off your seat. So again, this, actual, this particular article, there's a collection of articles from 1959 through the 1990s at different times. And this one was actually written in 1992 at the Forum, the Orthodox Forum in New York in 1992. And here's what he has to say about, so he summarizes the basic principles of biblical criticism. And then he says the following. Maskanot Eile, on page 112 of this one. Maskanot These conclusions of biblical research are based on compelling evidence which there is no possibility of contradicting. And anyone who seeks truth and acknowledges truth cannot deny the truth that emerges from these scholars. And since it is our tradition that what cannot deny what the eye sees and the, and the ear hears, <coughs> Um, we, the people of Israel, will not deny what the human mind tells us with certainty. We cannot lie to ourselves to turn a lie into truth and truth into a lie. Thus, we can no longer believe that the Torah is a uniform creation which could have been written in one generation by the hands of one person. Zoe a for Translation. Instead, 
we must accept that the Torah includes different documents, which according to the laws of nature could have only been written by different authors after generations of development. And only an editor could have gather, gathered all these books into one book. It is this Torah that we seek to study. You still say it? I'm mm -hmm. impressed. <laughs> Mordechai Breuer says that, that, that JEPD, the documentary hypothesis, is absolutely undeniable, unquestionably right. And you have to be a fool who doesn't right, who doesn't pursue truth to believe otherwise. So how's he a from Jew? I didn't mention Marah Poyers. Is Rav Shimshon Rafal Hirsch's great grandson? I didn't mention that. And uh, he taught me much. So he taught Chavron. He said he taught for many, many years at Yeshivat Haratzion. I had the opportunity of studying with him for a year and a half when I was at Gush Yeshivat Haratzion. He's a kosher Jew. He's a kosher from Jew, even very from Jew, who says that we absolutely must accept the documentary hypothesis. Namely, that the Torah is written by, what, what? The Torah is comprised of different sources. So, how is he a from Jew in accepting documentary apostles, which attributed to different authors? There are two words I just read, that maybe you picked up on, that are all the difference. Anybody pick it up on it? Pick up on it when I read it? Could have. What? Anybody? Could have. Could have? Now, in Hebrew, anybody? Bederech According to the laws of nature, <laughs> Report Habur says, you're right. There is no way that anyone reading the Torah honestly, truthfully, can see this as a, a, a text that reflects one voice and one view. That's a lie. And in that regard, the Bible critics got it right. There's only one difference. Because the Bible critics assume that the Torah is a human document. And as long as you assume it's a human document, then you have to attribute the, the contradictions to different sources, and that there are different documents. And they were compiled by a redactor. But what if I agree with of course, is, that's only if the Torah is written by Derech HaTeva. But his central thesis is the Torah is not written by Derech It's not written by natural rules, the natural course of writing. God is above Teva, but nevertheless, he wrote a book in the language of the human being, but it incorporated real, genuine contradictions. The same way J, E, P, and D point out to the various contradictions and what appear on the surface to be different voices and different sources and different language and different time periods and everything they're saying is right except for one little difference. Is they assume that the Torah is a written as a human text and therefore you have no other choice but to attribute these contradictions to different authors. And what if I says, no, you do have another choice. You can attribute these different contradictions to God, who speaks in different voices. God in Har Sinai, according to the Mordechai Breuer, gave a Torah that is comprised of complete contradictions, completely different worldviews. And that's because God is a complex being who created a complex world, a world of different layers and different dimensions. She tied the Machinot means different aspects. The world is comprised of different aspects. Life is complicated and complex. Now, specifically with regard to Bereshit the Perak Alpha, Bereshit the Perak Mordechai Breuer says, he says it reflects the two midot of God, Rachamim and Din. Rav Soledechik says it's more about the dual man. And I would rather stick with what the Bible critics themselves say, according to Mordechai Breuer. Namely, it's the J worldview and the P worldview. Except, instead of saying it's the J source and the P source, which is what Bible critics will do, it's perfectly reasonable, if you accept Mordechai Breuer, to say that J is the J divine voice, and P is the P divine voice. And once you have established the legitimacy of saying that J is a certain divine voice, and P is a certain divine voice, infinite possibilities open up for Parshat Otamikro. By the way, Mordechai Breuer said that, that biblical criticism was the greatest thing that ever happened. It opened up doors, windows, opportunities for, to learning the Torah in ways that were unimaginable earlier. He said this openly. And he applied it in his various commentaries on the Torah, whether it's Pirkei Bereshit, or Pirkei Mo'adot, or Pirkei Mikra'ot, 
Maybe he's got other books that you are familiar with. I'm not. And he applies this approach. Now, I don't want to get into details. I don't agree with many of his details, but that's not the issue. The issue is the legitimacy of accepting contradictions, not because the Torah necessarily is a work, a work of multiple authors, but that God speaks in multiple voices. Okay. I'm only going to give a few more minutes. So, logically speaking, if there is a P and a J voice in the creation story, which, or let's call it, right, two, two accounts of creation, which most of you are familiar with, and most of you are not particularly troubled by. Why would the Torah present only two voices, or two divine, divine voices, J and P voices, whatever you want to call it, in the creation story? What about the events that followed? Why would the Torah present two voices only in the creation story? And the answer is, there's no good reason. Let me ask you the following question. How many accounts are there of the flood? You're too smart. <laughs> if I were to ask you, my particular, if I asked the vast majority of people sitting in this room, and people weren't shy, particularly they are, how many accounts of the flood there are? You would probably say, one. Because who ever heard of two stories of the flood? In fact, the Torah tells it, unlike the story of creation, which appear in different chapters, the story of the flood seems like one narrative flow. However, in chapters 6 through 8, I devote three full chapters to trying to prove beyond shadow of a doubt, you'll be the judge, that there are in fact two completely different stories of creation. Reflect complete, sorry, two different stories of the flood. They reflect two completely different worldviews. Two different ideologies, two different conceptions of God, two different conceptions of the human being. You'll have to read those chapters to be convinced, or not. But it's a challenge I'm posing. I welcome anybody who wants to critique. Let me ask you the question. Why did Avram go to Eretz Israel? And that was no smart Alex. I don't mean smart Alex. You know what I mean. Why did Avram go to Eretz Israel? Come on. He's a smart Alex. Oh, you're too smart. Oh, come on. Right? Because God told him to go to the land. So we have a lot of smart people in this crowd who know that right before Parakid Bed, it says that Avram embarked on a journey along with his father, led by his father Terah, towards Eretz Canaan, literally a few sukkim right before Parakid, the end of Parakid Aleph. And it says, right, they left Eretz Canaan, and they took a detour in Haran. Right? So that means that he already embarked on the journey to Eretz Canaan, and not leaving his father, but going with his father. What on earth is going on? Answer. Answer. Help me out here. Two different albums. There are two <laughs> different accounts of albums on the other Israel. Israel. There are two different stories that reflect who completely different conceptions of why Avram went to Israel, what the role of Israel, what the role of Israel, why Avram two completely different conceptions. But now, in the last few minutes, I'm going to do something which is, I, I'm holding a chiddush for almost everyone in this room. Okay? And that's a challenge. With a very, very learned audience, so this is a big challenge. I'm going to deal with a text and this will not conclude, that everyone skips, because it's so boring. Look at Peric Dalit. Open up your homage and Peric This will be my final point, before you open up the questions. OK, so now, OK, you with me? Now. Typically, we read the Tanakh, we read Shefer Bereshit, and we're, we're struck by the incredible power of the, the, the narrative, the story of creation. The story of, of, of uh, Adam and Eitz Adad and Ben Eganed, wow! And, and the story of the sin, wow! And the punishment, wow! And then you've got Kai and Heaven, wow! These are soap operas for every one of them. Each one of them is a soap opera. And you can't, this is a book you would never want to put down. Until you get to the middle of Paradise. And Parakei. And what's going on there? Genealogies. Presumably, what's their purpose? What? Doing, what are they doing? They're linking what? Adam. 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 The generations of Adam and Cain. To? No. 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 Parakei for sure. Paradalan, certainly the genealogy of Parak Adam and Cain. And we typically skip these chapters. 
Because who wants to read boring chapters about genealogy? But I'm going to argue and try to prove to you in the next couple of minutes, and then I'll conclude, that there are two genealogies. Unless you suspect that I'm making this up. Take a look at the inner pair Now, you, you're going to throw some things out here, and then I'm going to give you a chart to show how clear this is. But I'm going to wait. I'm not going to give you that chart, because I want you to figure it out. See it on your own. Start from, start from Perik Dalid, Pasuk, Yudzai. Let's let's know the names. So who was, who's the person, the character at the beginning of Perik, Pasuk, Yudzai? Kain. Kain. OK. Who's next? Who's next? Hanok. Hanok. Who's next? Next. Irad, who's next? Mechuyel, continue. Metushael, Lamech. Then you have, Lamech has, right, he marries two women. He has three boys named what? Yaval, Yuval, and Tubalkayim. Okay? And then, for some reason, it goes back in Pasuk Kafhei, goes back to who? Back to Adam. And it says, he great, then he had Sheik, and then they had Enosh. So you have seven generations which have. Adam, I said, Kain, Chanoch, Irad, Mechuyen, Tushael, Lamech, Yavad, Yuvan, Tuval, Kain, and then you somehow go back to Adam, Sheikh, and Enosh. Now let's go back to, let's go to Parakeh. Says Sefer Todot Adam, Yom Bero Elohim, Bidmut Alim, blah, 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 Vayichi Adam, Shloshim, Umaat Shana, beginning Parakeh, Vayol, Bidmuto, Ketzalmo, Vayikrat Shmo, Sheikh. So now we have Adam followed by Sheikh, followed by, continue reading, Enosh, followed by, Followed by? Canaan. Followed by? Mahalaya. Followed by? No. Yere. Followed by? Hanoch. Then? Metushelah. Then? Then Lemech. And then? No. Take this page, please. A summary of what we just did. Take this. Take this. Take a look. It's all right. right. What we just did. Pass this out. Oh, sorry, sorry. Look, look at the two lists side by side. What do you notice? Similar names. Very, first of all, what names are identical? Chanoch. Lemech. Right. I'm sorry? No. Ah, but, but the names that are not identical are extremely similar. For example, right? What well, I'm sorry, but Enosh and Sheikh and, uh, are the same, and Hanoch are the three names that are identical. But what names are not identical, but very, very similar? Help me out. Kain, Kenan. Kenan and Kain, continue. Yerad, Yerad and Irad, next. Maharalel and Metushael. Metushael and Metushael. Have we covered Yerad? And we said Yerad and Irad. Guys, guys, guys. It's pretty much the same names in different order. And I will add for very, very different purposes. The genealogies here, you'll notice I didn't say genealogy, but genealogies, because just as there are two accounts of creation, and two accounts of the flood, and two accounts of Avram's Aliyah to Eretz Israel, there are two genealogies. And one is attributed to P for good reason, which I can't explain now because I don't have time. And one is attributed to J for good reason, because the J genealogy reflects J's worldview. But these are not accounts of the same genealogy. They are <laughs> one's B'nai Kain and one's B'nai Shet. Hold on. But I, they, there's, there's, there's Kain until the seventh generations, and then they go back to Adam in Perik Dal. Whereas in Perik, hey, Kain right, is the top, and then it goes, I'm sorry, Kain is the fourth. I understand. But the Part of Paragdalit at the end that goes back to Correct. Does and not have those similar Correct, names. and for good reason. It has the same name, but a different order, right? Adam, Sheikh, and Enosh appear in Parag Hay at the beginning. And Paragdalit, Adam, Sheikh, and Enosh appear at the end. And for good reason. Guys, what I'm trying to argue is I will not explain 
here in this forum, because my time is definitely up, <laughs> I will not explain what the significance of the P genealogy is versus the J genealogy. But I will say, and I will try to argue passionately, if I haven't been passionate enough until now, that there are, that there's a logic, there's an inherent consistency between the vision of P voice of God as described in creation and the events that follow and the events that are described therein and the account of the flood, it all makes sense. There's a logical flow because P has a particular worldview and he tells the stories in a particular way that work within its, his own worldview. And J does the same thing. But they have completely different worldviews. Different conceptions of God and different conceptions of the human being and different conceptions of what they're expected of us in the world, etc., etc. And so, that's what this book is about. <laughs> it's called, In the Beginnings, Discovering the Two Worldviews Hidden Within Genesis 1 through 11. This is what the book is about. It's not satisfied with saying, well, it's very nice we have two creation stories, which pretty much most of the people who knew it knew already. Trying to show this, not just two creation stories, the entire narrative, right? I wouldn't say it appears twice. There are two separate and parallel narratives that reflect two completely different worldviews. And if we accept what a high broader here, we're saying that doesn't prove that it's different authors. God has a P voice and God has a J voice. God has an E voice and a D voice, but we're not talking about those. Because the Torah, again, according to Mordechai Bar, was not written by Derech HaTeva. And if we accept that premise that it's not there, then God can write a book that is filled with contradictions because God himself. For example, we say openly, repeatedly, right, that God is Midat Adin, and God is Midat Ha. But those are two polar opposites. And yet, we internalize both and accept them both as true. We say Avinu Malkeinu. We say the two, right, together as if they mean the same thing, but they are polar opposites. Avinu means one thing, and Malkeinu means another thing. Well, if we can say Avinu Malkeinu, and we can say Midadadim Dachamim, then why can't we say that the Torah, the Book of God, right, can introduce us to a P worldview, the P divine voice, and a J divine voice? They're all from God. And what I do in this book is, besides presenting the two narratives and explaining the logical flow inherent in each narrative, I also color code it so you can see how J text are, are in particular red, although the red came out a little bit different from the red that I anticipated, it doesn't matter, and the, <laughs> and the J texts are in purple, and they reflect the other worldview. And I hope, I hope that after you read this book, you'll be convinced. But if you're not, then you'll share your feels, you'll share your opinions and your thoughts, and you'll argue in the name of learning and Torah and the pursuit of an end. If you disagree with something, you're welcome to. As a matter of fact, any book that I sign, I write there, please share your thoughts and comments, and I give my email because I would welcome it. You know? I hope you don't reject my entire thesis. I hope. But I'm sure that you might disagree with some aspects of it. But that is my thesis. And that's why. I believe that what I'm doing is a dramatic new reading. Stop trying to reconcile or harmonize contradictions. They're all over the place. Let's accept and embrace the contradictions. That's what I do. Now, so here's what we're gonna do. We have time for questions. I know a number of you are gonna have questions. At the same time, I wanna mention, some of you may wanna save this part of the, the, the evening, but um, um, many of you have received the link. If you wanna purchase the book, you can um, you can uh, just fill in the link, it'll take you about a minute. And um, if you don't have a link, just uh, uh, speak to Alyssa, my wife, my wonderful wife, who will be happy to send you a link. No, <laughs> will be happy to send you a link so you can, you can pay for the book right on the spot and pick up a copy as you walk out. Um, and, that, and, the, and the second thing I want to say is if you do like the book, please spread the word Facebook and Amazon, whatever it is, to get the word out. Um, if you like the approach and if it's appealing to you and you find it, Innovative and interesting, I hope refreshing. Spread the Okay, so now, having finished my presentation, <laughs> 50 minutes. He pushed me to try to really try.
try. I'm trying my best. Okay. I said it would be under an hour. That I promised that it was. Okay. So having done all of this, please feel free to ask any questions you want. If you have anything I said or anything related to it. Bakasha, open the floor. Come on, come on, come on. Yes! Okay, Rebecca. Good question. It's a personal question. Um, look, I've had a passion for Tanakh for as long as I, for my adult life. And I also studied with Mordechai Breuer um, many, many, many years ago. I, I, I left after a year and a half for reasons I don't want to go into, but I got a lot out of it. Um, and I've always taken an interest in, and I, 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 so I don't like I typically, for those who know me, I don't like you know mainstream things. I like to step out of the box and see things differently. And um, and I guess what I encountered not long ago, some of the you know biblical criticism in its original form, you know, not just through, reflected to others, but <coughs> actually encountering some of them. You know, thanks partly also to David and Sarah who who have a wonderful library. And I spent like in five years mostly doing research and, and making trying to make sense of this, um, and also meaning. And one of the things that I that troubles me, and people have said they've read little for criticism before, some very respectful pe respectable people, that they find it empty and boring and technical. And I, I'm not a technical guy, I'm an educator, that's my first profession. And so the goal for me in this, in this quest was to, to find meaning behind right, the, the contradictions. And it's, it's not enough to say, well, attributed this to this source. It's, what's that mean? What does it mean to me? And so it's about meaning. I'm a meaning-seeking creature, as most of us are. And, and well, typically, biblical criticism leaves you hanging with the question of what does it mean? Is it more interested in, in who wrote this and then you leave it? And, and that's, that's exactly what I refuse to do, because it's, it's all about finding a deeper meaning behind this. Um, yes? Sure. Um, you, you definitely indicated you follow the approach of Roger, but on the other hand, you didn't just write a translation of Perkei Breshid, you wrote not a book. Not not so in what ways do you differ from Roger? You'll, you, you'll have to read his. But, but say, you have, you, are you saying you're, you're just, what, what, if I could pick Roger's book or read yours, what, give me a reason why I want to read yours. It's not I'm going to say, Roger. that's a very arrogant statement I'm going to say, and I, I have no better way to Roger say it. would argue that he, he wouldn't mind. Okay. <laughs> First of all, what if I were, if he knew he was a very caustic, kind of tough, you have to have the courage to speak up in this class. Because he, did you have the opportunity? Did you have to study? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. It, and, you know, I didn't, maybe I spoke up once or twice, but typically I didn't, because I didn't want to take a risk. Um, and um, I think that, um, I think that Mark Breuer didn't fully understand J.P., the documentary of us. In fact, I'm fairly certain that he did not. And so, if you notice that I'm quoting not from his P.K. Brashit, I'm quoting from his early articles where he talks about the theory. But when he actually wrote his commentaries, I believe that his commentaries reflect some great deal of ignorance about the actual... He wasn't trained in Bible scholar, biblical scholarship. Um, he encountered it at some point in his life, and he fell in love with it. Um, but I don't think he fully understood it. Like, for example, he never referred to J and P. And he instinctively translated J and P as Bidata Dini, Bidata Rafa And that's a complete misunderstanding of J and P. And there are other things. But, you have to read both and then compare and, and decide for yourself. Yes? Hi. Uh, Why? Um, human psychology yes. detests contradiction and inconsistency and unpredictability, it creates stress, yes. creates a discomfort. When you talk about documentary concepts, you talk about you know, socio religious you, you know, perspectives where they're coming to battle each other, that you understand because that's, that's human nature. We, for forever, we've had. But it's very rare in, 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 you know, for us to have a situation where you have one voice speaking in different, in different ways. Why, if, if, if we were talking about as a, a single divine source speaking in different voices, why is that a good idea? Why, why is that something that would appeal to mankind as opposed to creating confusion, which it frankly has, All right. um, as opposed to something more palatable that would be a little bit more complete and consistent and even okay. in multiple aspects. I'm going, to, I'm going to read another section of Mordechai Breuer. I almost thought of presenting it here, but I'm going to read another section. It's from actually 1959, I guess. Um, he says the following, on page 22 of this book, against the collection of articles. Sheva no mar shetorani shalayim zguka le signon yesuyah. Lest we say that Torah and Shalai needs a specific method, a style. Why is the Torah? Maybe we assume the Torah should speak in a very clear language, right? In one unified voice, right? That would make sense to the average person. 
שיעידו אם לא התורה משמיים, לפחות התורה אחת, הנתונה מרואה אחד. Perhaps we should dictate to the creator of the world a specific style and method that would prove that the Torah is one voice given from one, from one shepherd. אך בעצם העמדה תביעה זו, זה attempt to demand that God, that he speak in one voice, כלום לא התגלינו כקטני אמונה? Doesn't that show our lack or limited faith? המוכנים רק לאמונה בתנאי, who are willing to accept faith on conditionally, התובעים את אמונתם בתורה משמיים בתנאי סבירות של תוכן וסגנון, whose belief or faith is dependent on consistency, a style, a style and method. שמא כיפוחו של דבר, lest the opposite is true, שמא לא אנחנו נקבע סגנון ותוכן התורה, it's not up to us to decide on the style and the content of the Torah, אלא נדמה לי התורה מה סגנון ותוכן היא קובעת לנו. What does learning the Torah mean? Not imposing a uniform voice on God, because that's imposing our Torah on God. Let's learn the Torah, right, right, that, that is in front of us. שמא נבטל את רצוננו מפני רצונו. ונאמין באחדות התורה תוך ריבוי יריעותיה. Right? Maybe we should appropriately cancel or, or, or suppress our will right in front in favor of God's and accept the, the Torah as in its multiple voices or יריעותיה, I guess. What garment? I don't know. כלום לא הגיע הזמן שנשתחרר מכל נטל השקפה האנושית. Isn't it about time that we free ourselves from the burden of eight? A human, a, a human worldview, v'nilmai Torah Hashem, let's learn the Torah, b'lite ha'ktuma, without a presupposition about what the Torah should be. We have to pray, k'lum ha'torah yishava v'samachat v'rat v'parshanut harmonisti u'miyushenet? Must we impose a harmonistic, old-fashioned approach to the Torah? K'lum ena Torah na'ava chasuda, gam ka'asheri Torah k'lmot shehi? The Torah itself is what it is, and our job is not to impose one worldview on it, and harmonize country with the audience. The audience, so, so, so you're right. We're the audience at the right We are the audience, and the Torah, and, and, and perhaps Boyer would say that the Torah was written, for, it, it, and, and could be understood at many levels, and that's God's intention. That, that's why we read it over and over again. So when you read the story of separation, in your first, second, or third, or fourth, or fifth grade, you don't even know it's the two contradictory stories. In fact, 99% of the world who study the Bible don't, Realize that the two stories contradict each other in most blatant ways. And then you get to the flood, which is even more, you need kind of Sherlock Holmes to glasses to be able to decipher it. Um, so it, it is readable on different levels. And I'm talking to a highly sophisticated crowd. And I'm writing for an intelligent, sophisticated crowd. Not your average schmo on the street. Um, and so I assume that the people who, who are willing to engage in this book are people who are willing to hear a more sort of complex uh, learning the Torah, which according to my word is exactly what is meant. That's the deeper way of learning the Torah, is seeing, not trying to harmonize, but to accept the contradictions with all their beauty and richness, rather than trying to impose our own worldview on them. I think that's the beauty of studying the Torah this way. Yes? So. The classical Sephardic commentary is actually what's called the Shittata Yun. Shittata? Yun. Okay. It was based on the etymology okay. of the world, word, as opposed to debating two different scholars, like, po uh, like polemics and, and Baba. And I used to think that, well, well what is all this? Why? That, it's trivializing, but I think, uh, I still don't understand the four schools, but I see what we got here. There are various ways of interpreting God and his intentions, and I think a lot of it was influenced over the generations by how the Torah was copied. We don't know the last word, but uh, the interpretation is, is very diverse. And I think throughout Judaism we have two, uh, two dominant schools all the time. And I think this is part of the original uh, will of God to create a bi-narrative, okay? To, for whatever reason. We're, we're, it's, we're always battling in, in this combative Torah and Bible where we're, we're, we're always, one is being pinned over the other. There's, obviously there's a motive. We don't understand the motive. But, but I think you're pointing to, to um, a template which is, which is very interesting and obviously you never thought. Okay. Uh, template. It's a template. Yes. 
your work relate to, you know, the particular style of the, you know, the work of the Muslim and things like that, and then you're able to make this, there's two stories and one relates to the next, and you look at the so I would say the flaw in, first of all, I quote Grossman all the time. Intertextuality. Intertextuality, which I certainly agree with. However, one thing that I think is necessary in, in, in our pursuit of intertextuality is first identifying whether it's a J, E, P, and D source. <laughs> or if you can't do an intertextual study <coughs> on a source that's attributed to J and then, intertextual, and then intertextualize that with a P source. And I think that until you recognize the voice, strands slash voices, right? then you, you, only after you've identified, then you could do this intertextuality. And I think that, first of all, Yerzaka, these are world-class scholars. Jonathan Grossman does it to some extent. Uh, who's the third one you mentioned? I don't know doesn't do it so much. Um, I've read all these, I've read all this stuff, and, and, and you'll have to ask yourself which approach, which approach is more convincing. Um, Grossman's book I refer to extensively. Some of the parts that I agree with, he, he wrote, for those that don't know, Professor Jonathan Grossman, who's a tremendous, tremendous Bible scholar, a katonti in terms of his breadth, katonti. But um, in a span of five years, of a, a, a Kukabri sheet, which is 11, whatever he calls it, it's I call it great, whatever. And then he writes a book about Avram, then he writes a book about Yaakov, then he writes about Yosef, and then he writes about, I don't know, the, the, over the, it's, it, and over the like, short period of time. But <coughs> again, he, he he, I find him not sort of wishy-washy on these questions. Not carving a very clear path, whether he accepts or doesn't accept. He's aware of all the scholarship, but at the end of the day, I find him confusing or, or lack, a lack of clarity. I invite you to read my book on Rishi and his book on Rishi and compare and contrast. I invite them. Uh, I actually get to sit with him and give him a copy, and I'm, I'm hoping to have a kabuto with him about this stuff. Um, but in other words, yes, I believe in intertextuality, but I need certain rules that need to govern any kind of intertextuality. Yes. Yeah. How, far, how far do you go with this beyond Tanakh? Like contradictions between two Mishnayot, or in the Rambam, contradictions in the Rambam. Do you just say, you know, we just live with it, we don't have to look for, look, look for an answer? And then if you do that, then how much have you taken out the rug out of, you know, traditional learning? All of the whole yeshiva's learning. Is First of all, when it comes to Ramba, we know that it's one one author attempting to speak in one voice. There, there is no so I believe there's at least grounds to trying to make sense of the Ramba within the Ramba. But when you ask me halachically speaking, right, like Mishnayot, right, and I'm not the first to say this. Like Pinchas Hyman, by the way, has a whole koshitata rivadim, and he developed the exact same approach with regard to Talmudic scholarship, and he was lambasted for this, but he stuck with it. Those of you who are more familiar with Talmudic studies can, answer, can speak more intelligently than I can. But he, he personally did, in other words, it, it, there are different levels and different layers and the different voices and different schools of thought. And, and, and he, rather than always reconcile, he developed a approach that says, let's separate them and understand there are different schools. Shittat um, al Pilchas Heyman, if you want to look that up. Um, what? He called one too. Oh, is that right? Oh, I didn't even know that. Thank you. Um, yes, so the answer is, listen, the text speaks for itself. In other words, if anyone reads my book or other books, similar books, and is not convinced that there are actually two, two narratives going on here, Shalom Yisrael. And I, I, I have nothing more to say. But I invite you to read this and ask yourself, do you find this compelling or not? If you find it compelling, then to deny that there are actually two voices or two worldviews being expressed, is, is, is a problem in terms of the search for truth, right? In other words, I believe that they're there and they're very real. That's what you do with it. And Mordecai Breuer's us offers us a way to, to be within the real world, so believe in Torah Sinai, and yet to accept this and to embrace this. To embrace this. Question. Yes, you. Two questions. Go ahead. One you is also writing a book of these chapters. <laughs> We've um, had occasion to talk. More than once. We've discussed. Yes. Okay. Um, so, Rabbi Breuer, when we wrote the, drew a very sharp line between the identification of the strata within the Torah, like these so-called documents, on the one hand, which he, in which realm he completely accepted the conclusions of the Bible critics, and the attributed meaning, which he saw as like, if that's not their sphere, that's, that's mine, Rabbi said, and now you're done. 
right? So first of all, do I understand correctly that basically you're doing the same thing? You're saying the definitions of what Husserl belongs to which document and so on, you're taking as is from the documentary hypothesis and just attributing meaning. Attributing meaning, but I have a different approach to his meaning. I understand, but you're doing a different meaning than Rebecca. Correct. Okay, so that's one thing I want to clarify. Okay. Um, and my second question is, the, the, the specific appellations that the critics gave to these documents, you know, J, E, P, and D, um, were at least partially, and specifically in the case of P, had to do with their historical assumptions. Meaning, but Bible criticism was not just about identifying the documents. That was one stage. And then the second stage was, was, was right, when history. In fact, well, sure. in two different books. He had one book about the composition, and then another book right. about the history right. based on that. And the reason they called it P was because of this theory that was written by a bunch of priests in the time of Bias Okay. So, Reboy, I think, partially for that reason, maybe just for that reason, changed the names. Instead of saying, talking about J and P, he talked about Kanache Mavai and Kanache Malakim. I see you're sort of like going back to the critics' appellations. No, I'm going to go not, but not because one has to historicize it. It's because I, because I think that he, he, we have different explanations of why we're avoiding avoid in his actual parshanut, the terms, the, the categories, the appellation, the J and the P. Okay. So why do you think it was? I don't think Why don't you say that privately? I, say, I don't think he understood. I don't think he properly understood J and P. I don't think he understood. You knew that those were the names there. Yeah, but I don't think he understood them quite so. Because I said this earlier. Because to apply J and P and say, this is Midat Adin, Midat Arachamim, is a complete misunderstanding. P means priestly. It doesn't mean Midat Adin. It's a whole different world view, and I don't think he understood it quite uh, properly. I think he had great intentions, but I don't think he properly understood it. But again, that's me. You can read Word of Hybor. I advise you. Read Word of Hybor, Pirkei Bershi, read Yonatan read Grossman, read my book, and you'll decide. You know, you'll decide what's more compelling. And the Vakasha, let's look at, you know, Barbet Torah. Anyway, 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 well, I, I think we're going to, 9.30 is our I have a question. Yes, question. we're going to have like two or three, because at 9.30, I think it was done. Like, we started at 8, actually, yeah, started yeah, yeah. at 8.10. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to keep anybody. I'm going to push you on this. Like, you're using your yeah. Rebbe Breuer, I think, as a cover to make it kosher, right? Like, yeah. you have something there. <laughs> but you're really exposing a lot of people to biblical criticism here, and especially by using JMP. So I guess my question is, are you at all nervous that people will pick this up? Am I what? Are you nervous yeah. that someone will pick this up and be exposed to it or make other assumptions about the divinity and authorship of the Torah? Um, you know, whether it's kids or people who haven't heard of this theory before. You think kids are going to pick up the Torah? We also have much worse. So does anybody does anybody have a hat? Because in order to answer this question, I have to switch hats. Um, I wrote this book as a sort of a Bible, I want to call myself not a scholar, but a Bible reader, interpreter. But my other hat, which is actually my primary hat, is I'm an educator. Okay, I have a PhD in education. I spent 35 years of my life teaching in all kinds of levels. Some people in this room are actually my students. Um, and <laughs> And so, and so, um, and so, I have a lot of experience teaching, you know, particularly high school, and and I, here I think I knew Avi. I don't think the average, even most incredibly intelligent high school kid, would 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 even think to pick up a book like this. Um, first of all, they should pick up a book. They should pick up a book. <laughs> then, if we're lucky, they'll pick up a book that relates to Torah. And then, if they pick up a book, and the book that happens to have some Torah in it. They should pick up something that's sophisticated. It requires TikTok version. Yeah, when's it? Yeah, no TikTok version. No TikTok version. Not forthcoming. So, so Sarah, you jump around so much. So, so Sarah, the answer question is, is. Okay, I'm going to rephrase it. Do you think Tanakh teachers should be using us? I think that Tanakh teachers need to be aware of this. And listen, here, I'll something fascinating. Here's something fascinating. Why is it? That in, in most, even modern Orthodox circles to, today, thanks to Rav Soloveitchik, when people study Rishi, the first chapter of Rishi, they're already, correct me if I'm wrong, most yeshiva high school kids, if they study Sefer Rishi, have probably heard a great of two creation stories. Now that is e exclusively right to credit the credit of Rav Soloveitchik. <coughs> but the fact that high school kids are capable, or intelligent high schools are capable of reading the two stories of creation, means that it's possible to teach high school kids right, two different versions of the same event, or not the same event, two different stories of, of the creation of the world, and to grapple with what that means. Now, again, you have to be a sophisticated high school kid, but I imagine the high school, Yeshiva high school kids who are studying this 
in this way are probably sophisticated. And I'll just simply ask the following question. If you are able to teach two multiple cre creation stories, right, as two stories, separate, different, contradictory, then what's to stop us from teaching two flood stories and showing how there are two, in fact, two flood stories? Or two stories of Avram's Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael, which there are, in my opinion, and you'll decide for yourself whether you agree with me, um, and two genealogies. In other words, it, it, I think our goal as educators, gradually, is to introduce our students, our youth, to complex and abstract thinking. And how we do that is a challenge, especially in this day and age. But we certainly should aspire that our, as they get older, we should gradually introduce them to higher levels of thinking and higher levels of learning text. And, and, and the beauty of it is that, again, these stories can be read on different levels. And so, yes, I think that every, I'm biased here. I think that every Tanakh teacher should buy this book and read it. That's an objective statement. However, I do believe that anyone who's serious about things that will stand, stand to gain from reading this book what they choose to present to their students, that's their business. And it has to, it's a function of chanaflanarp.co. And they'll decide. But I think they need to be aware of this um, because I, I think, I think it's, it's telling a story that's often missed. And it's the, the different layers of it. I, I think it enriches our understanding of the text of Judaism. Yes? I'm going to reinforce what you're saying by being brought up in a very yeshivish world and then being becoming aware of the diversity of Tanakh and having been don't, don't be lied to all through my education, <laughs> then I think it's important that everybody read the book like Thank you! What do you mean by the person? Hired. So she's your photographer, so. Uh, yeah, 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 she's my photographer, that's right. Oh, right. The, the, picture, the picture of me on the book is thanks for that. And, and, and my white teeth. Oh, that's nice. Oh, <laughs> <Sure. laughs> shit. <laughs> thanks to his office. Yes, Jenny. Dude. I'm sorry you're going already. Anybody feels they have to leave, they don't feel in any way compelled to stay. I, I just want to reinforce coming from the, the opposite um, opposite end of the spectrum where you know I went to my mind these and we were exposed to all kinds of uh, issues and books and opinions. And I feel like a book like this could have been part of the curriculum of Maimonides. And even if the school didn't necessarily agree with what the book posited, it would have presented it to us so that then we'd be able to grapple with it. Like when we learned, uh, you know, about the 10th grade biology, we had a, um, a section on evolution, and then one of the rabbinim came and spoke to us about how the Torah grapples with, you know, and how halacha grapples with evolution, and how do you answer people about did God create the world or not? And so obviously, it's important for our So you're saying world. this should be taught so they can, the, the teachers they, the, the teachers can, can then do Dham Ashatashi. Right, the point being is otherwise. Not right. That's not what I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want them to come back and say Dham Ashatashi to David Harvey. Yeah. But okay, so, so, we, so if we don't agree. No, it's fine. But it's a difference between assuming that this is something we're going to reject at the end of the day. Oh, any other questions? Who's yeah. yeah, Bra yeah. Bra Bra it's not a question, it is my experience. Yes. I'm for three and a half years now Jew, so I miss a lot of background. But I was a Christian for 30 years. So when I was in, in, uh, in, David, in David's class, I had a really like profession. Uh, so I did ask questions really. But um, I'm sometimes I was thinking, oh my gosh, they are questioning God. Do they still believe in God? <laughs> Is this like, and then I said, okay. Are you, I still believe in God, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> 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 so it's, it's, but it is so amazing, you know, that this is Hashem, and this is so wide and so broad, and then that you can question Hashem like this, and still have your faith in, in Hashem, and that it's, it's, it's really opened my eyes so much, and I'm, I, my older son is a new Christian and his whole family. So I'm thinking about it to send it to America because they live there and see what he will say. So it will be like difficult because in Christianity we cannot do those things. No. And this is, this is really what I so love in Judaism that you can do those things. Uh, I, think, I think we're, I think, are we done, sir? Yeah. Okay. I'm staying, uh, listen, I'll stay. Just one, listen, guys, if you want to buy the book, and you don't have the link, just ask Alyssa to send you a link. Anybody who bought a book, I'm happy to sign a copy. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming.